Here, folks. Um, Thursday. Today's Thursday. October 1st. Oh, yes. October 1st. It's a deadline. I've been very pleased to see lots and lots of email come into my inbox. The vast majority of you have finally converged on what I asked you to do. Um, the deadline is, as I mentioned a million times tonight, midnight. So I have about 50 or 60 blog posts so far. Um, hopefully, maybe more, I'm not quite sure, but those of you who want that, uh, ten, those 10 points of credit should make sure you send it in in the next 13 hours. Um, don't do it during class. Okay, so um, today also uh, office hours are 3 o'clock until 4 o'clock. In case you're coming by, you might want to, if you already have a question on homework two, which you haven't seen yet, but you'll see it by the end of the class. Uh, homework one will hand back at the end of the class. I'll take a brief uh, moment to go over the uh, most popular ways to not get points, and then uh, you'll be able to look at the detailed answer key when that's posted, I think, uh, well, soon, right? Yeah, either today or tomorrow. Right. Homework two is going to be due one week from today. Uh, one week after that is the midterm. So, um, why does that matter? Well, anyway, you'll have enough time to get it done. Um, I don't know. I'm just kind of like, I'm like in, in the middle of a complete haze and daze. But anyway, hopefully it still makes sense. I'll try and say um less. I've been reading the transcript of my coming. So, are there any questions? Uh, anybody? Outstanding stuff? I saw a car wreck today. No? Uh, yes? I kind of learned something about how inefficient um, AC transits are. Yeah. So, because there's a bus that goes on college, I'm more, like I normally take the bus to get to Evan. Mm -hmm. But then today I found out if I walk to the telegraph and I take the long way, I could take less time. Then just like going there, waiting for the bus. It takes less time to walk. Yeah. It's so sad. Well, that's the see now. I'm with you there, right? So individual efficiency versus systems efficiency, right? Um, and uh, I think it turns out that the biggest thing on mass transit is that people, they don't necessarily care that the bus shows up on time. They care that it comes every 10 minutes or so, right? That's, I just go to the bar to get on the bar and the next bar. You know, people, but if the bus only comes every 40 minutes, then you're screwed, right? You miss it by three minutes, then you have to wait another 40 minutes. So um, mass transit has to be... Any other Q&A? Any other questions out there? Outstanding stuff? Okay, okay great. Um, income elasticity. You asked a question? I screwed it up. So this is a clarification. Um, there's three types of effects that you're going to have with income elasticity. This again is the change in your demand for a product given a change in your income. Control for income and the quantity that you're demanding. And that's going to be less than zero for inferior, between zero and one for normal, and then greater than one for luxury. In the last class, I said something like normal good is exactly on one, which is ridiculous. It's this range, right? So if you're, yeah? Oh, sorry. No. That's, so. um, normal goods, so what is um, normal and luxury goods are dependent, will be called dependent income elasticity? So for example, water, let's say. Is water, if it, it income elasticity is more than one, is that a luxury good or is a luxury good just like a city friend's car? No, 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 no. This is the economic definition of a luxury good. Okay. Right. So it's not our definition of what is luxury. It's Forget all that normal common sense stuff. Right. Okay, this is economics. So luxury, how's that? Or e-luxury, the economic luxury. It's it just. I mean, the idea essentially is that um, I mean, Mercedes Benz is not something that the average college student will go out and buy. Right. They uh, so. As your income is increasing, you're, you're going to be switching from these goods, ramen, into Mercedes. Okay? And the luxury, I mean, it's, it's a tendency. It doesn't mean you automatically go out and buy one, right? But it's a tendency. That's what you say. Any questions about that? 
Okay, it's just, it's a it's a definition. The word gets thrown around a lot. It's not necessarily. Um, it's, it's almost like the only thing that I could do is say, the elasticity is 0.5. What kind of good is this? It's, it's kind of hard to figure out why this matters in real life, but it's, uh, the word is used all the time. Okay, so let's go to the theory of the firm. This um, is, a, is a phrase, theory of the firm, that is connected to a, a, a 1937 paper by this guy Coase. It turns out that Ronald Coase, who uh, I'm pretty sure got a Nobel Prize in economics, he basically wrote two papers. And one of them was called The Theory of the Firm. And he wasn't even the first to do it, but he just he was, a, he was just like a really clear expositor. And the other one he wrote is the, the problem of social cost, I think. I think that's assigned in this class uh, because that is, um, or is it not, suggested? Somewhere? Coast, well, whatever. I'll discuss it. But the problem of social costs is essentially trying to figure out how to handle externalities. Okay? How do we deal with um, somebody who's polluting us? But the theory of the firm uh, basically is like, well, what? when do you have a firm? When do you not have a firm? So let's take the example of a coffee shop. and a donut shop. And the question really is, in the theory of the firm, is should we merge these into one entity? This is not an infinity science, just not be so clever. Should we merge them into one bigger firm or not? Okay? Now, what is to be gained? So, if you have a coffee shop and, and there's, uh, you know, uh, Mr. 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 Coffee runs it. Mr. Coffee runs the coffee shop, and he's the coffee entrepreneur. And Mr. Donut runs the donut shop. What is the What are the benefits to be gained by merging into one? I mean, or let's look at the status quo. What are the What are the the, the the negative aspects of having a separate coffee shop and a separate donut shop from the perspective of the business people, not necessarily from the perspective of the customers? You have to run two shops, two guys, two shops, right? So you might, you might want to throw away a guy. So we've got um, two managers. What else? What else? Total overhead costs. Overhead costs, like a fixed cost in a yeah. sense? Okay. So uh, let's just call it double overhead or fixed costs. What else? They have to sort of like adjust their price according to the other one. Because like coffee and donuts are complements, mm -hmm. so if donuts like were to lower their price, then coffee might think about like increasing their price because people are going to buy more coffee. Okay, so there's a problem of profit maximization uh, between the, um, uh, you know how do you get the maximum profit from both of them when they're not coordinated, right? So that's that's important. Profit max. I'm just going to call that. What else? You already had one. Someone new. Production costs? Production costs in what sense? Like, um, okay, so there's, in a sense, there could be some kind of economy of, uh, of scope, really, or scale. So the overhead is an economy of uh, scale. And there's another one called economy of scope. Let me get into. Let me take a little side trip on that, which I've got on number seven here. What does what does economy of scale mean? I've talked about it before. It's not the first time you've heard it. Right. Okay. And the. Um, Scale. The more you produce, economy of scale, so increasing returns to scale. As you produce more, the marginal cost is decreasing. Okay? Increasing returns to scale. It's the opposite. What's, what's the technology going to look like that's leading to increasing returns to scale? This is decreasing costs, right? So uh, I don't know how to 
let's say, increasing costs from scale, increasing returns to scale is the technology. What does the, that graph look like that's going to give you this kind of cost curve? I'll take a wild guess. <coughs> Should you write it on your paper and show it to your neighbor? Can you do that version of it? <laughs> do it in the air. What does it look like? Huh? Upward sloping. Upward sloping. Like this. This is uh, output. And let's call this, uh, these are all inputs. Is it this kind of upward sloping or is it this kind of upward sloping? A or B? B, right? I mean, that's, that's uh, it's increasing at a decrease. Well, actually, hold on a second. It's actually A, isn't it? B is the one that's intuitive, but increasing returns to scale, we haven't gotten to decreasing returns to scale. This B is decreasing returns to scale. D, R, S. A is an increase in returns to scale. The more you do, the more you put out. And that has um, <coughs> something to do with uh, um, running something at higher and higher efficiency. I mean, the analogy, the, the uh, idea is often that nuclear power uh, plants are increasing returns to scale. You make this huge upfront investment, and then you know the first megawatt hour or the first whatever unit of energy is very expensive, and as you produce more and more, each additional unit is cheaper and cheaper. So that means that more Right. So for each additional unit of input, you're getting more and more output, which is kind of weird in terms of what we talked about, kind of like the, not, it's, not the it's not the equivalent of the law of demand, but it's like what we would consider decreasing returns. The, the fact really is, is that the shape of this uh, curve is often increasing and then decreasing. Okay, so you have an inflection point. Remember that word from math? And here, You've got, so that what we have here is that in the calculus, we've got the first derivative, um, I'm just going to call it uh, change in Q, change in input. I'm just going to put a generic thing called input. The first derivative is greater than zero throughout this uh, curve, but then uh, it's, here is where it, the second derivative, remember that? What's the, what's the second derivative? Here. Concave down, but it's less than zero, right? And over here? Greater than zero, right? So, and at this inflection point, it's literally one, okay? It's constant in terms of scale. So it'll be a 45 degree line going through here. So this is going to be an area of increasing or decreasing returns to scale. Increasing, right? And over here? Decreasing, right? So, excuse me? Well, what I asked was what leads to this curve over here, right? And that would be A, to this one here. But the fact is, is that marginal costs, after a while, goes up again, right? So what's, what's going on over here? What's going on with the technology over here? Not, not inefficient. Hmm? Yes. Use the letters over there with the calculus. What's going on over here? Decreasing returns to scale, right? Increasing returns to scale, and guess what? What's going on here? Constant returns to scale, right? This one point. So let me neaten that up for you. point out something which is going on is you got input, you got output, right? And over here, you've got cost, marginal cost, and you've got output. I've 
drawn this for you guys before, so, but this is going to be a slightly more complicated one. Increasing, decreasing. Okay? And the, and the marginal cost is going to be what? Falling, stop, rising. Okay? This is a very popular cost curve in economics because there's lots of curves, lots of calculus, lots of optimal points. All right? So this leads to that. And this essentially is a marginal cost is assuming the cost of your inputs is, is, is static. You're a price taker, right? Let's not make life too complicated. Just from the perspective, okay, so this is like calculus and curves and accounting or whatever. But what, if you're thinking in terms of a business, and we're going to get back to the business for a second here, what is, what kind of reason are you going to have this switch? When, why are you going to go from increasing returns to scale to decreasing returns to scale? What's a real world reason? Hmm? Demand is not the reason. This is production side. Okay, demand is over there. Yeah. You maxed out your technology. You maxed out your technology. You might be running your plant at 110% of capacity, right? Or you're running your workers at uh, more than eight hours a day, or sometimes more than 14 hours a day. So the cost of inputs increases? Uh, I'm going to hold that constant. <coughs> what else? This is basically the answer, is that you're, you're hitting a limit on one of your inputs, right? Not the cost, but the limit of the, it's, it's kind of like I said before, you've got, the, you've got the coffee machine and you've got three spigots and you put three people, then you put four people, then you put five people, after a while you're just like, you got too many people, right? Is a nuclear power plant example, would using too much water be an example of when you would stop using too much water? Well that's a, that's a, that would be kind of an input constraint, right? But the, the power plant example is is where, you know, for the, when you're running uh, at low, uh, uh, volume for the nuclear plant, you're running at a 10% capacity, you still have very high costs, right? Those costs will fall if you get up to 80 and 90% of capacity. As you hit 100% 100, 100 capacity, they might bottom out, and you go to 110% capacity, and now you've got to start babying it along, right? It's the, it's the notorious, uh, put it up to 11. Remember that? Okay, so if you put your amp up to 11, what's that? That's spinal tap, right? You're, you're, you're pushing it beyond its design limits and something will break. And this is what's going on with the firm. <clears throat> you're all happy land here, and then things start, the costs start going up, right? At some point, it will, you will exceed uh, optimality, and in, in economics, you'll exceed optimality because this is your, your, your price is lower, your cost is greater than your price, okay? But in a pure engineering sense, you'll exceed optimality because you go like this. And you start breaking fast, right? You're running the engine too fast. Or whatever. Right. Yeah. As soon as you go past the inflection point, you're getting into decreasing efficiency, right? You're willing to go past that inflection point if you're actually going to be making money. But this is the economics. This is the engineering, right? Technology markets or technology costs. So this is this is how these things relate, and it's it's very similar to um, utility in the sense that the way that you have the utility function is how happy you feel about something and then how much you're willing to pay for it. <coughs> but this is technology maps onto um, profit maximizing decisions. You guys in the back are all happy to sit back there? There's lots of open seats, you know. All right, cool. So, I know my voice projects. So, um, the other fact, the, the, one of the big limiting factors in any company, any firm, is what I mentioned before, management talent. Okay, it's the idea of uh, you know that guy, the Brazilian guy who runs the juice shop. I never actually been there. Who's been to that thing? It's really good, right? Is it one dude though, right? The manager. Yeah, or the guy, the owner, the guy who started. He started with like an apple cart. Yeah, yeah. So it's one guy though. There's no chain, right? So you're not. You might see the McDonald's version of that if he could figure out how to duplicate himself. Right? McDonald's is every you know McDonald's is is boring, but as a business model, it's pretty good because.
because they can figure out how to do a 65 cent hamburger across whatever 15,000 international outlets. Okay, so if your if your limiting factor is going to be your manager or the, the 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 charm of the person who's selling you something, then you're going to start hitting decreasing returns to scale. It's not the machine anymore. Now it's just the human element. Does that make sense? That's the economics. Okay, that's how businesses are going to work. Um, <coughs> Okay, now, what's the difference between scale and, so scale is just output of a widget, we'll call it uh, a widget X, okay? What's the difference between scale and scope? What does scope mean? on 
uh, productive variable costs or marginal costs, right? My favorite example of that is, um, um, I think it's KFC was doing this, but I know McDonald's, you know, who's had an apple pie or those pies at McDonald's? Who's had one of those things? And it's they're like, mmm, yummy. You have to be like completely drunk, right? <laughs> but what do they do? It's like, well, we have this deep fryer here. It's already making French fries. Let's just drop a pie in there, right? Because that's how they make it. Yeah. It's deep fried. Yeah, but not the same Yeah, but whatever. It's the same uh, bin, right? They just put another thing next to it. It's not the same oil, but it's like the same bubble or machine, right? So you just put, you just divide the oil in half. It's not a big deal. And then just drop your pies in there, too, right? I thought KFC was trying to fry everything for a while. They're like, fry the chicken, fry the French fries, fry the, fry the pie, fry the ice cream. So once you got your fryer, you just put as much stuff through that fryer as you can, right? Once, once you have a kitchen, you cook as much stuff as you can. It's, it's, it's kind of like, you know, if, you go to, if you're in the dorms and, you know, I'm the guy with the blender, and like down the hall is the person with the microwave, and like everybody's like setting up this kind of virtual kitchen, like, oh, I need to blend something. Okay, good, right? So, on the marginal side, you can also have um, lower costs because you might have simultaneous production processes, right? The idea that while the person is making your coffee, they're also getting you a donut from the bin because the coffee machine is warm enough. Okay? Yeah. But isn't there also a factor, for example, if you have a kitchen, you cook, you cook as much as you can for Chinese, uh, Indian, other stuff. At some point, nothing is good anymore. I mean, it's something. Yeah, mix it all together. No, I mean, or like if you make. No, okay, so, but the, what you're getting there is you're now, so if you scope out too much, right. then it's like when you go to, I mean, if you go to like small town USA and it says Oriental cuisine, it's like we got Japanese, Indian, Thai, it's like it's just a whole bunch of rice all thrown in the same spice bin, right? So it's just like. But I mean, the quality of individual That's products right. and those staff. That's right. Yeah. So, that, so, so, you know, you might be saving on costs, but the, the quality is falling because essentially you, you've expanded out too far, right? This is General Motors with nine brands of cars or however many brands they have. They couldn't pay attention to any one brand, right? Um, and, that, and that's kind of, the, in the business, the, the MBA is it's like stick to your knitting. You know, what's your core competency, right? But you don't go to core competency, competency where Apple is only making an 8 gigabyte nano and that's it. It's like, well, we can do a 16. Oh, okay, that's not too hard, right? But you have a 16 and a 32 and a 64 and a 4 and, and 14 different colors and, you know, different jacks and different plugs. And after a while, people are like, I don't understand, right? They, it, your customers came in and understand how to buy something. That's the typical, that's the typical uh, Chinese restaurant menu. It's like 50 pages long. And you're like, holy cow, right? Just tell me what the special is. So there will be increasing uh, economies, and at some point, decreasing economies will, will kick in. Customers don't understand what you're doing. The quality will fall. Um, you've got products mixing in with each other. You don't have enough refrigerator space, whatever. Okay, you, yeah, you have no idea what your inventory is because you've got too many products. This is a, a not uncommon problem as well. Okay, so that's mostly what I want to say about scale and scope. Let's go back to our firm. Two firms are trying to decide whether or not they want to merge. Okay, and we basically we we talk about all of the, a lot of reasons why they want to merge, and the the way this has been um, uh, the way that Coase explained it is he basically said, look, here's your firm. There's activities that are inside the firm and out to activities that are outside the firm. You will bring them inside your firm if the change in profits from bringing them in is greater than the change in costs. Okay? It's obviously if you make money. That's kind of like, it's 1937. We're still talking about nice, basic, simple economics. So the, 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 the border, his idea was, well, do we want to expand our firm be bigger or not? Do we want to take more activities in-house or do we want to set or send them out? This is outsourcing. Literally, this is where outsourcing is, is coming from. Okay? Can we, uh, the University of California, shall we outsource our janitorial services? 
UC does not do that. Many, many companies do do that, right? Shall we outsource our advertising? Shall we outsource our printing? The UC has its own printing plant, right? The UC is actually much more like a Soviet-style bureaucracy than, uh, you know, uh, a cutting-edge entrepreneurial business, right? They got their own janitors, they got their own power plants, they got their own uh, accountants, they got their own. Um, I mean, the printing press is kind of crazy. They have buses, all kinds of stuff that a firm would tend to outsource out because of what? Why would a firm make the decision to outsource this question, the, the activity? Cheaper, cost less. Specialization is why it's cheaper and cost less. Or that leads to cheaper and cost less. That's the root cause. What else? That's the cost side. Relations. Hiring a janitor. Yeah, that's actually really interesting. This is like California agriculture, or sorry, agriculture in general. You've got your farmer on a field, and he's got his uh, farm workers, and um, the law says you got to have documented legal farm workers. And legal farm workers turn out to cost 12 bucks an hour. The illegal farm workers, of which there are many, and who I love because they're workers, let's say they cost $8 an hour. So how does this guy, the farmer, get away from that problem? What he does is he, oh, he says, I'm going to subcontract to this guy, the coyote, who brought some buddies up, or not buddies up, and he will guarantee that those workers are legal. They'll sign a paper. No problem, amigo. And I pay him eight bucks an hour. And essentially what I'm doing is I'm paying less and I'm shifting the risk. In fact, let's just, just do it in a real economic sense. I pay $10 an hour, right? Why would I pay 10 and not eight? Cheaper than 12, okay, yes, I'm not an idiot. Anything else? No, it was the risk, right? So it's, this is actually 10 equals $8 plus risk. But now I pay $10 and I have no risk. I just shifted the risk to be amigo, right? <coughs> Who's willing to take the chance because he's one dude in a truck. I have a farm, right? This is why uh, illegal drug cultivation does not occur on someone's property. They do it in national parks. You can seize that land. It belongs to the feds, right? <laughs> That's shifting the risk. So, and we're going to get more into risk later on, but this is like literally, literally risk, the thing that you guys understand in terms of like, you know, car insurance and accidents and stuff like that. So this is an outsourcing decision that, that is getting at uh, the legal system and essentially how efficient or inefficient the system is. So the decision whether or not to outsource or insource, let's use the, that word, is going to be made on the decision essentially it's like, it's going to be one of these things. Change in profit, change in activity, right? If it's greater than zero, are we going to outsource or insource? Insource, right? If I put my activities of my firm up, then I'm going and my profits are going up. I'm going to insource it, right? And if it's the other way around, I'm going to outsource it. I essentially mean almost anything the firm can do. All right. It could be either on the cost side, cost or maintenance. It could be on the um, activity side in terms of what you're producing. Right? Are you going to produce donuts or coffee? Right? So we have this thing of, of two managers. That's a cost. There's overhead. The profit maximization. Um, and uh, there's a hand up. Does someone have a hand up? I'll get to the next thing in a second. Yeah. No, that's what I'm claiming is if you pay the immigrant eight dollars, you take the risk. If you pay the, the coyote ten dollars, he takes the risk. Right? That's two dollars of risk. I'm basically just saying it. Okay. So um, the question really is specialization. 
versus um, generalization or, or essentially, well, let's just call it generalization. This is not jargon, general, general. Specialization means that you are going to narrow your scope of activities, right? Not your scale, but your scope. And generalization is you'll expand them, right? So that's essentially the boutique, the specialist firm versus the conglomerate, right? General Electric has finance and nuclear power plants and um, electricity generating gear and, and submarines and a whole bunch of stuff, right? And then um, Pete's Coffee does coffee. Right? Pete's Coffee does not own coffee plantations. They uh, probably roast their own stuff. They might outsource their janitorial. They're trying to concentrate at what's called sticking with their knitting. Okay? So this is, the, this is the constant tension within firms. That's why you see firms that are, that are expand, adding a division, throwing off a division, getting into a business, getting out of a business, because they're always sitting there. This is like probably the... That's why this, this paper is so important, this code paper. It's, it describes the fundamental dynamic of companies and businesses, right? Including the guy at the juice stand, right? Including McDonald's. It's, it's applicable to all of business everywhere. Okay? So our coffee guy and the donut guy, they might discuss a merger, right? They will, they will merge if the profit is positive from the merger, right? So the big uh, thing is, yeah, we can save on costs, are, we're going to actually benefit in terms of customers because we sell a donut at the same time as we sell coffee. They don't have to decide to walk next door or walk two blocks away. That's significant. But what happens if the coffee person is really good at making coffee and they screw up donuts because they leave it in the fryer too long? Right? That's the problem of, of uh, generalization as opposed to specialization. Right? So this is what's going to go on. And the customer's like, it's like AM, PM, uh, mini market. Yeah, you can get a coffee. Yeah, you can get a donut, but they suck. Right? Or you go to the French pastry bakery and they're like, oh, we make the croissant, da, 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 da. and it's all they do is croissant. When I was in high school, my, my mom uh, went past this place at, at closing time and they were literally throwing out boxes of, of pastries. It's like, these are old. They're from this morning, right? They, they, they're French. They don't do day old, right? The Americans are like, the Americans are like, they take home, we take home food from the restaurant. Doggy bags don't exist in most of the world, right? And, and it's like, day old? Yeah, go ahead. You know, 50%. And people are like, I'll eat it. But the French are like, no, no, we're French, we throw our croissant out. So my job ended up being collecting the donuts at the end of the day. from the. From, so I would drive home with this huge box of pastry. And it was just really nice to have a couple on the way. So, because we took it to the church and all that stuff. So, if you go, if you do your donut thing, uh, if you do your donut thing as a donut store, you better be a good donut store, right? Because if you don't do donuts well, you're out of business. And same with coffee. You can merge and potentially do better because you're saving some costs, you're making your customers fine, if your quality is relatively good. But if someone comes up and these two little stores can start up next door and they start you know, really outproducing you in terms of quality and quality value, which is price per quality, then you will go out of business. You will have to, to, uh, you'll have to find a way of competing. Okay, yeah? I just have a general idea about like the labor dynamic of it because I feel like with the merging obviously you're gonna have like the higher end people like you're gonna reduce the number of managers basically. However, for the lower end, like the people who are actually the baristas or they can only do the barista part. So right. I feel like the unskilled crop workers will right. still remain the number So if you have say you've got two people in here and two people in here, now is the firm gonna be able to get along with four? Yes, right? You're not saving anything, but you're not losing money, right? If you can do three, then you're saving money. If you need five, what the hell is going on here? Right? That's wrong. So this is the notion. It may not work, and then you might have to go to this, but that's not necessarily a problem. So at this scale, it could be okay. Right? The, the guy who runs the juice stand, he has like 60 products. So he has, but he's like, 60 products, yeah, I got bananas, and I got mangoes, and I got oranges, and I can, you know, I can have a banana shake, a mango shake, an orange shake, a banana mango shake, a banana orange shake, you know, so the menu gets really long very quickly, but it's actually a few small ingredients. If he starts doing tacos, and he starts doing, you know, whatever, massages, then he's going to be out of luck. You said that both have to be, like, relatively decent, but if you weren't too, shall I say, like, the other, and 
essentially. So if the, say this is awesome coffee shop and crappy donut shop, does awesome coffee owner want to merge? It could start out as like awesome donut shop and then And then it goes downhill because your business partner sucks. Right? So so potentially your customers will put up with something because they're willing to pay for some convenience. Right? This is the idea of uh, the triple play or quadruple play with your cable, phone, phone, mobile phone, all these other things. So, like, okay, I'll, I'll, but what happens when you do a triple play or cable, a, an average cable bundle, which is whatever, 40, 50 bucks a month? It's like, we'll get into bundling and, and price discrimination soon. But if, if you, um, you know, you're, you're willing to uh, have your phone and your cable from the same company, even though the company may not be the best at either, if what? Cost less. Cost less, right? It's like, or one bill, even. but cost less, that kind of thing. So the customers are willing to put up with the degradation of quality if they get some cheaper price or convenience, which is essentially the same thing, cheaper price. Other hand, yeah. All right, so does generalization mean, or which one does it mean more? Like Walmart, who has a lot of different types of products, mm -hmm. or where you own the multiple stages of the production for your product? Okay, so that's multiple stages of the production is called vertical integration. Yeah, vertical. Okay, and this is more about horizontal integration, right? And Walmart is, a, it's kind of hard to figure out what a retailer is, a big box is, because, you know, it's not like there was, in, in the, back in the day, there was Walmart, uh, well, in fact, there was back in the day, Walmart only did, like, clothes and stuff that didn't go bad, right? And then they started getting into the groceries. So that was a horizontal move outward. Walmart does not care about vertical integration, right? The opposite of Walmart was Ford, the River Rouge, the Rouge River plant. It's very, very famous. They used to take in uh, raw, uh, they used to take in coal and iron and rubber in one end of the plant, and out of the other end of the plant would come a car, right? They did everything inside that plant. That's total. And they own the rubber plantations, they own the coal mines, they own the, the iron um, mines. So they were doing everything from literally almost like a cradle to grave situation, or a cradle to out the, out the door. Walmart is, is sitting there going, we don't care about supply, we're just going to see, you know, we have our roof, what can we put under our roof? And so they've gone into food because that's um, not too far away from what they're used to. Okay. So yep. then would Walmart be specializing in just the final product, and would the other one be special, specializing in just that one product? Right, in a sense, yeah. Walmart is specializing in retail, Yeah. right? And then there's other people that do the wholesale or the production. They usually cut out wholesale, they go straight to producers. Other questions? No? Okay. Um, the other uh, aspect that's interesting is that, um, why am I mentioning this? I'm not going to get into that. Ah. Okay, let's get out of theory of the firm and get over to profits, profits, profits. Um, So who can tell me the difference between an economic profit and an accounting profit? What's an accounting profit? The positive number at the end of the numbers. What numbers are you, it actually depends on what numbers you put in here, right? So I've got, I got sales minus costs, profit, right? The question really is, what are these? What costs are you including? Uh, that's not what it's, uh, includes opportunity costs. Opportunity costs, right? So um, say that you have your coffee shop and you sell $100 of coffee and the cost of goods sold is five dollars, and your rent, let's just say, is ten dollars. You have eighty-five dollars. You're the coffee entrepreneur. Is your you have an eighty-five dollar accounting profit? What's your economic profit? Is it greater or less than eighty-five dollars? It's it's less. 
in terms of opportunity costs, I'm going to put in, uh, I think this is valid. No. Opportunity costs essentially are, are what? What you give up to do that, right? So say that you could make $100 uh, sweeping the floors, right? Is that firm economically profitable? <coughs> no. Say that you get $20 of utility because you like being your own boss. Is that firm economically profitable? Right. Yes. So the que there's a whole bunch of like all kinds of, you know, economists, people hate economists sometimes because all we do is like, let's just redefine everything to fit our theory, right? So if you want to, you can basically define away, you can literally define away all profit by saying, oh, let's make sure we take this into consideration and that consideration. This is the way the utility function includes everything. My utility from the whales that exist in Alaska is positive, therefore I'm a happy person. It's like, whoa, hold on. So in, with, with, oppor with uh, opportunity costs, you can include many, many factors in there, many of them very hard to quantify. So when you do accounting profit, that's when you include opportunity costs, but when you do economic, you don't, or do you like Accounting profit is only, let's just call that cash. Okay. So economic profit is when you include the opportunity costs. It includes, I mean, it's, it's, it can be foregone cash, but it's no actual cash flow, right? The opportunity cost, so I, at the start of the semester I said I'm teaching this class for free because my salary is going up because I'm a, a lecturer and it's going down because my postdoc are taking it out of my salary. So what's, what's the opportunity cost of, of me being here? Make up with something. Don't want to time that you could be doing something else. Time I could be doing something, essentially time. Time is the biggest opportunity cost. This is the idea that time equals money maybe. Right? Or, more importantly, it equals utility. Right? There's a notion that people have a disutility from labor. That when you work, you, you have to be paid because you would prefer to just hang out. Leisure. Right? But my, my time, I'm obviously making a, a rational decision. I think I'm making a rational decision. My time is that I prefer to lecture than to use this time elsewhere. Right? Or potentially, uh, this uh, I'm learning something, so this contributing to my human capital. That's another expression thrown around. Or potentially, I'm contributing to my career because um, this lecturing is helping uh, me with respect to the way other people see me. There's, or you know, the whole idea I'm learning. That's the kind of thing too. So let's go back. To, let's go to you guys for a second. You're going to school. The cost is uh, where's our union laborer? Out, is she protesting somewhere? <laughs> she just sits over there. So the cost of school is like 10k for fees plus 10k for rent, let's say, plus what? What's the opportunity cost of school? So you could be making more than a job. Foregone earnings, let's say 30k. Not hard to say, right? I mean, you can do that at, at, at the uh, peaks or whatever, right? So your decision to go to school, is it 50K? These are all costs. Is it 50K? No, I'm just going to make it a year round thing. Is, it, is 50K the right number? Just cost, look at the cost. There's interest here on the 10,000 in fees. What's that? There's interest here on the 10,000 in fees in the bank. Um, I think we should be doing that. Let's put it like that, okay? That's good. Yeah, you'll be paying rent anyway, right? Uh, maybe. So here's the thing that's kind of obvious: is like you go get your thirty thousand dollar job, do you pay ten thousand in rent, or do your parents pay ten thousand in rent, 
right? So, I mean, there's all this other thing, cost shifting. It's like, oh, my parents are paying, so school was free, right? But I find, and almost everybody will, is that uh, rent or the cost of housing, is that a, a normal good or an inferior good or a luxury good? Normal good, right? So if you're making out making thirty thousand dollars, are you going to live with uh, share a bedroom with somebody? Huh? No, I did that when I was in school. God damn. Westwood, West Westwood, yeah. So maybe ten thousand, but look, if I was outside, maybe it would be fifteen thousand, right? So really, my cost of going to school, I'm actually saving five k. So maybe it's more like. Uh, 35,000. 35K, right? That could be a way of just looking at your basic opportunity cost type of calculations, right? Yeah. But if you were not going to school, like you could be living at home with your parents, in which case you don't have to pay anything for rent. But then you have to live with your parents, and that costs more too, right? <laughs> right? So that's the idea is like, Oh yeah, I want to pay rent because I don't want to live at home, right? So, but you're you're right. You could save you could you could save money in terms of cash, but then you're you're having a disutility living with your parents. This would go into that whole debate over how much rent you would pay. Okay. So, but then there's the benefit. When I talked to you guys when I did that little walkout thing, and I said, um, uh, I said, well, maybe you're going to go to school and you're going to learn something, and then you're going to graduate, or you, or you don't learn something, and you get a piece of paper. And someone says, oh good, instead of paying you 30000 a year as a high school graduate, I'll pay you fifty. Right? So that's something you'll take into consideration. You take the sum across time, across four, five years, and you get 175 k of costs versus twenty uh, k per year for 40 years, or let's hope less. 800,000 versus 175,000. 175,000 spent now, 800,000 over my lifetime. Is 800,000 the right number to use? Come on, Mr. Discounter. No. Right. <laughs> Why no? Because, as Wimpy, would, as Wimpy would say, I will gladly give you two hamburgers tomorrow if you give me one hamburger today. Right? If you have a dollar today, it's worth more than a dollar tomorrow. Right? So $800,000 over your lifetime is not worth $800,000 today. It's worth something less than that. Probably, this is where we use discount rates and stuff like that. So, let's stop this thing for a second. Yeah. <clears throat> Go? Yeah, okay, so, <clears throat> more things. We just did opportunity costs. We did cost accounting in a sense. Cost accounting is just finding your nickels and dimes. Okay. Now, cost accounting, I find I, I, it's actually very much in vogue right now because of people that are doing uh, carbon footprints. Has anybody been following that? The idea of like those uh, metal, steel, metal bottles. The New York Times did a story on them and said, like one of those uh, things over there, said that um, if you use that bottle no, on your desk, that black bottle, <laughs> that one there, right? So the, the, the cost benefit uh, in terms of carbon footprint of steel bottles versus the equivalent number of plastic bottles, okay? You've got to use that bottle something like 500 times before you save the earth officially, right? So. Uh, when you go to these corporate events and they start handing out bottles like they're candy and you take them home and you put them on the shelf, you did just kill a tree or whatever, right? So you really have to um, be careful about, it's called life cycle analysis. What goes into the steel, manufacturing, shipment, the, the plant that made the steel, I mean it's like this kind of crazy accounting that just goes on forever, compared to plastic which is you know merely barrels of oil, petroleum. So cost accounting is another kind of cost. I'm doing this because I'm talking about profits, um, but it's it's usually about money and it can be about things like carbon or something like that. Um, and then cost benefit, how does that work? How, that's a very important tool in economic analysis. Why is cost benefit important recently or since the, since uh, a little bit before you guys were born, since the Reagan years? Why is cost benefit, where is it being used most obviously? 
Where have you heard that expression used? Anyone? Future investments. Future investments? Not, I don't know. Help me. Well, you try to figure, you kind of see certain things, you know, is it going to benefit more or cost? Yes, so when you're doing a cost-benefit calculation, you have to think about the stream of benefits over the future, right? But um, do firms make cost-benefit calculations? Oh, did you see my shirt today, by the way? Do you know what the answer is? Did you, see, did you read the Because it says, in very small type, it says, why did the economists cross the road? Why? The marginal benefits and the marginal cost. The marginal benefits greater than the marginal cost. Duh. Okay, so, <laughs> it's so bad. But, oh, the thing is, the shirt is actually even, uh, it's got a better story than that. Because I bought it and I got it, and I'm like, man, this type is so small, and I can't even read it. And then I called the company, um, uh, Cafe Press, and I said, I hate this shirt, I want to send it back. And they said, just keep it. Cost benefit, right? So they credited me back. My cost was zero, except for my phone call. So, um, 800 numbers though, right? It's just now it's my time. Okay, but it was a good story. So I've told the story like 20 times, so now I'm going to make a career out of this shirt. So, um, do companies do cost benefit? What does it mean? What are they doing when they're doing cost benefit? What's their version of cost benefit? Marginal cost <clears throat> greater than marginal cost. Right. Less than marginal. Right? That's not hard to understand. That's been going on since the beginning of time. The hunter wakes up in his cave. Should I go out? I'm hungry. I better go kill something to eat, right? Cost benefit. We know about that. But the revolution in cost benefit occurred in the environmental sphere, in the economic sphere, resource, environmental sphere, when they started looking at regulations. This, you could also call this the Full Employment Act for economists, right? The government now, and since the, the Reagan years, has been doing cost-benefit analysis for things like dams, right? Or uh, freeways, or um, Regulations, regulations, safety regulations, right? The cost benefit, so the co what's the cost of a regulation? Throw out an idea. What's the cost? Enforcing it. Enforcing it. You got some bureaucrats. Yes, what else? Dead weight loss in a sense of additional uh, a, a reduction or the increase in price, reduction in quantity. What else? Huh? What's that? Thinking of the regulation. Nego negotiating the regulation. Extremely interesting area. Um, we'll get into lawnmowers if we can. And the B&B. What else? That's the political economy of regulations. <laughs> like groups who are against yeah, so that's kind of negotiation, fighting over the, negotiate, over the regulation, right? Well, the biggest cost of a regulation is that, for example, they say, um, um, what's that stuff that um, they use to kill? DDT. Who's heard of DDT? It's a, it's a pesticide. It's, in fact, an insecticide, right? It's been, it was very popular in the U.S., in the 40s and the 50s to do what? Uh, everybody wants, someone wants. What did you say? <coughs> to kill mosquitoes, right? Cheap. Effective. But what? That's the, that's the benefit. <coughs> What's the cost? It has an impact on birds. The, the eggs get too thin. I actually don't, I'm not up to speed on this because apparently there's some controversy whether DDT actually does that. But let's just say it's true. Okay? So this is the benefit. No, oh, sorry. This is effective. This is the benefit. The cost is equal to cheap plus dead birds. Right? Not popular. Right? So DDT was banned. Now luckily, 
and this is not an accident, DDT was banned after we got the benefit from it, right? Essentially, we don't have malaria in the United States. The problem came when countries in the developing world tried to use DDT to kill their mosquitoes, and activists in the developed world said, oh, no, no, you can't do that. You kill your birds. Well, meanwhile, people are dying of malaria. A little bit of a problem there in terms of the weights that people are putting on, these activists are putting on local people compared to birds, right? Oh, if your people die, that's okay, but we have to make sure your birds are alive. <laughs> right? So this is an example of a, a let's say, a controversial cost-benefit. The cost-benefit is, is often, you basically look at the, you look, or benefit cost, you take the benefit over the cost, if it's greater than one, it's a good idea, right? That's a ratio. You can subtract it. You can say if it's positive, cost minus benefit. It doesn't, you can do it any way you want. The problem is um, when you get into uh, who is calculating the costs and who is calculating the benefits, right? In the case of dams, which I'm, I know more about because of water, you get the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and do they like building dams or not like building dams? They love building dams. And guess who does the calculation of cost-benefit for a dam? The Army Corps of Engineers. So they say, oh yeah, this dam is going to cost a million dollars, and we'll finance it with 0.5% uh, bonds over a 50-year period, which any finance guru will tell you means nothing for free. And the benefits include flood avoidance, recreational benefits, irrigation benefits, and we're going to get all those numbers just by making them up, which is what they do. Okay, and that's why you have these, you know, essentially white elephant dams, and the, the, they would say, oh look, our cost-benefit ratios, and they just actually did this the other day, it's 1.05, <coughs> so for, for every dollar we spend, we get a dollar five back, right, but they forgot to include a million things, the real one might be 0.65, should you build that project? No, but guess who makes the report and the decision? These guys. This is like the most interesting area of uh, abuse of numbers that I can think of, besides Enron accounting. This is Enron accounting government stuff, right? Another idea of regulations and um, of cost benefit is, uh, you know, you might have a regulation that comes out and says we have babies have to or children have to have fireproof pajamas. It turns out, and, and in order to figure that out, you have to talk about the value, value of a statistic, statistical life. A very controversial number. Some people say a life is worth what? Priceless. Priceless. Infinity. Right? But not like MasterCard. Right? But if you're going to do a regulation, and I'm going to say, I'm going to uh, regulate the... Um, the uh, ink in a pen, because if you put it in your mouth, and it might poison you, and you might die, so I have to, and if you die, that's infinitely bad, so I'm going to ban pens. That kind of logic will run you into trouble very quickly, right? Because if a life is worth infinity, then essentially you shouldn't do anything. You should actually just die, right? Because you can't do anything. So this doesn't work. It turns out to be the government, I don't remember the exact number, but it turns out to be that the government uses a number about like six million dollars. EPA, you can look this up on the EPA. Oh my god, a life is worth way more than six million dollars. My favorite example of cost benefit or a value of statistical life is that if you, in the old days when we had uh, coupons for airline tickets, it would say, in the event that this plane crashes, we, the airline company, will pay you fifteen thousand dollars for your life or something like that. If it crashes in the United States, then we'll pay you fifty, right? So dead Americans were worth than dead worth more than dead everybody else, right? Or a dead somebody who uh, a dead German who came to America and, and died in America, or a German who came to America and died in America on a plane. So this idea of six million dollars—that's an American life. Well, what if it's somebody from Zimbabwe or somebody from China? Well, obviously they should be the same, but in many cases they are not the same, right? Either it's a political economy question or it's um, uh, just the, the national culture, that kind of thing. The idea of, uh, what was it, during the, there was a war, and the army, oh, it was the, um, 
It was the Iraq-Iran war in the 80s, and I think, I don't remember which side did it, but they actually uh, sent out soldiers uh, to clear minefields by walking through them, right? So if you stepped on the mine, you would find it and die, right? And that's how they were doing, that was their cost-benefit for uh, military activity. They clearly did not value those soldiers at $6 million. So this, it, it, cost-benefit turns, turns into this really interesting, amazing, huge thing uh, it gives you all kinds of interesting stuff to think about. I'm going to stop talking about that for a second and keep going on profit. Do you have a question? Oh, no, I was just going to say, it's kind of like when auto manufacturers put out like a defective car. Right. They'd rather not recall it because the cost yes. of them recalling it is greater than... Right. The that's the so that's seen. where economists and lawyers are both evil together, right? Yeah. So it's like, look, we'll, it'll cost us 50 bucks a car, we'll have a, it'll, and we have 100,000 cars, that's $5 million. Maybe somebody's going to sue us. We'll settle out of court for two million dollars. The cost benefit, uh, the cost is greater than the benefit. Screw them. We'll let some people die. Right? That has happened. Um, so back to the, to the, the safety, the safety pajamas. Right? It turns out that the, the cost of a life saved is something like seventy thousand dollars. So is this regulation a good idea or a bad idea? Good. Right? Cost benefit. A value, if your value of a statistical life is six million, and the cost per averted death is seventy thousand, that's pretty good. Okay, the same kind of calculus has gone into um, medical innovation, where they talk about um, they actually have figured out that uh, fixing AIDS is more important than fixing cancer. I'm not. I'm just relatively speaking, more important than it used to be because it wasn't the number of dead people from AIDS; it was how many years. They would have lived had they lived, right? People that are dying of AIDS in their 20s and 30s, cancer you're dying in your 60s and 70s, right? So one dead cancer person is worth less. You need like three dead cancer people to equal one dead AIDS person, literally in this calculation, just in terms of years uh, of uh, lost life. So this is the kind of stuff that shows up in cost benefit. Let me finish up with profits here. Let me get to the homework. Um, so. Economic profits. Now, in the long run, what happens with economic profits? They go to zero. Because of what? How do they go to zero? Everyone goes into the market. Say again? Everybody, the competition, everybody Entry. Goes into the Entry matters, right? A monopolist literally does not face entry. The monopolist controls the market, right? But if the monopolist is making a profit greater than zero, and somebody says, hey, I can come in and, make a, and, and, and exploit this market too, then you start dividing the market between the monopolist, now it's a duopoly, if someone else comes in, assume they compete, right? They might not compete, they might form a cartel. They might just say, hey, let's just be nice to each other. We'll have, uh, what's that called? We'll have um, dignified competition, right? Every year they go and they meet, uh, at a, a nice hotel in Switzerland and decide what the prices of their products are going to be and the next year the price stays that way. Those cartels um, have been found, they've been caught, of course, uh, and fined millions, even billions of dollars. There was, a, there was a, a vitamin C cartel or something like that. I mean, they were fixing the price of vitamin C. It's like, it happens all the time everywhere. But in the long run, economic profits are going to zero because of entry, okay? If there is not entry, you're not going to have, um, profits will not be falling. Now, entry can be uh, prevented for two different ways. It can be prevented because the government does not allow a competitor to come in. This will happen if the government decides to license oil exploration to one company, uh, or they give it to the, the president of the country, gives the oil exploration license to his kids, that's the kind of the Indonesia situation. Uh, or it could, but there could be a technological barrier to entry. Profits will be positive. Is that bad? Is there something to do about it? Let's say it a different way. Is it like, is that the people, the fact that iPhones are popular, is that a bad thing? Should we prevent Apple from selling those for whatever it is? I think the full price is like seven or eight hundred dollars. The unbundled price of the iPhone is eight hundred bucks. Should we make them uh, make less profit? Because it's bad, because they're making profits. No? Hey? Isn't that just motivation for other companies to come up with something as good? Right. 
This is called the honey pot. You want to get into the honey pot if it's got positive <coughs> profits, right? So this is what um, this is what motivates innovation. The aspect of positive profits. Now, when we say in the long run, long run profit. Let's do the other run. Profit long run equals zero. The question is, how long is the long run, right? If the long run takes three or four years, or 30 or 40 years, that's a long time. And if, um, if it is long enough, then you'll have innovation. And in fact, the fact is that we see a lot of innovation. Right? There's some notion that patents and trademarks are ways of defending profits to uh, promote innovation. There's also a notion that, that there's been some, some capture uh, in the sense that the companies that are making those profits, they will lobby the politicians to extend their monopoly even further. This is the, the famous Mickey Mouse copyright, because they were going to lose the rights to Mickey Mouse, and Disney said, oh no, it's not just the lifetime of the creator, but it's the lifetime of the creator plus 70 years, which is like forever, right? So Mickey Mouse still belongs to Disney, and they still make all the money off of the Mickey Mouse caps. I better hurry up, i got to get back to the, uh, to the homework. So we have to worry about barriers to entry. But this idea is what drives innovation. And this actually, it, it's, it's, there's an argument that we never get here. Okay? That was the idea of, this is actually, th if this is equilibrium, right, then we're always out of equilibrium. Economic rents, they are 
returns to innovation. <coughs> they can be returns to corruption. You go bribe a politician, they give you a monopoly, you make a monopoly profit, you're getting rents. If you bribe that politician, you're willing to share those rents with the politician, that's why the bribery occurs, because you're making some money. And that's political economy. Let's stop now, and, I, and don't go anywhere. I'm going to take a, a brief moment to go over the homework uh, one. Okay, is a gallon herbs around? So, uh, are you, you, oh, you're not enrolled. That's right. right, I couldn't find your name. Okay, and Manzini? Manzini? No? He dropped. But he dropped. He dropped. And this is an ad. Okay. So I'll let, um, we'll hand these back at the end. I won't throw them out there. We have homework two also that we'll distribute at the end. Did the homework two get made? Yeah. Yeah? Awesome. Okay, so um, I'm just going to go quickly over the biggest problem. Um, and if you'll recall, the first question was, the government decides to expand the ad campaign against drinking soda. Okay? The number one thing that people got wrong on this was identifying the winners and losers. Okay? If they think if the winners from a, a campaign against soda are who? No, not on the supply side, sorry. Supply side. Substitutes for soda. The losers on the supply side. Soda manufacturers. Who's going to be contributing to the campaign to, 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 to uh, oppose that ban? The soda companies, Coca-Cola. All right. On the second one, FDA puts standards on fertilizer. Same problem. The winners, the losers from the, the regulations on fertilizer are fertilizer companies. On the supply side. Sorry, supply side. Right. The losers are. Or the winners are on the supply side. Substitutes for organic uh, for not organic fertilizers. Fertilizers, there's organic and inorganic fertilizers. Hopefully, that's what we were talking about there. The the um, let's go back to the winners. The winners on the on the demand side for for uh, soda taxes. Losers on the demand side, soda drinkers. The price of soda goes up, or is that what happened? It's just an article. So it's shifted the demand curve in. Right on. It's not the soda tax, which has been done in New York. Okay. Obviously, you know how much I know. Okay, so, number three, the representative consumer with the Cobb Douglas demand function. So, people did not understand. That was the most common thing. They didn't know what, how to get a demand function. You basically, you get your utility function, you set up your Lagrangian, you solve for X star, right? Your demand, and your demand must be a function of exogenous things. Is your demand for uh, is is your demand for good one? Is your demand for good two exogenous or endogenous? Exogenous. Okay. <coughs> Sorry, it's endogenous. You don't put your demand for good one is not a function of good two. Your demand for good one is a function of your income and the price of good one. Okay. When you write a demand function, that's what you should do. You should not have x1. Demand for X1 is a function of X2. On the um, cross-price elasticity, that was the worst problem, as far as you guys were concerned. Um, what's the cross-price elasticity for complements? Is it positive or negative? For the price, complements, did I say complements? Change in demand for good one based on the change in the price of good two, P2, X1. If it's a complement, <coughs> beer and chips are complements, right? The price of um, the price of beer goes up. Does your demand for chips go up or down? Yeah. Down, right? Substitutes, cross-price elasticity, Coke, Cola, and Pepsi. Price of Pepsi goes up, demand for Coke goes... Right. That's what you need to know. 
course, you have to be able to do the math. Um, two consumers who have, okay, this was just written out. Uh, this was an, ag you had an aggregation pro problem. It was, it was X1, one consumer had one demand function, utility function, the other consumer had a different utility function. The way you aggregate demand is you get their individual demand functions, you add them together, that's aggregate demand, okay? And it might be tricky in terms of doing the addition, but that's essentially the idea. Um, the economy with a um, Leontief utility function, what's the Leontief utility function mean? The minimum of one good and the other good. What kind of uh, utility is that? What are those goods to each other? They're perfect complements, right? So, do you use calculus to solve those? No, okay? The problem was is that some people were, they had these indifference curves, and they were trying to find, uh, you know, uh, uh, a tangency when you can't, you can't get a tangency on a point, right? So, what you need to do is you have to just write out two equations. You just write the demand for good one is a function of price of one. And, uh, I'm screw this up. Ah, no, what you do is you say, you say, um, because of the ratio that was provided in this, in this, in this product, you knew that you needed to have these goods in, in bundles. So you know that 3x1 and, and th uh, 2x1 will be linked to uh, 3x2. And a fixed ratio, because they're perfect complements. It's like left shoes and right shoes, one and one. In order to solve that, to find out how much you're going to consume, you just do P1 X1 plus P2 X2 equals M, and you plug one of these things, you solve for X1, you plug it in here, and then you can find X2 as a function of only prices and uh, income. And then the same thing happened with, uh, the same, not the same thing, but the other thing happened with the last question, which is about perfect substitutes. People, you can't do calculus. You got these indifference curves. Okay, the budget constraint, the slope was the question, right? So you're going to find either a corner solution, which means that a corner solution that's wrong down here. You're going to get the highest indifference curve you can, right? It'll be a, it'll be either all of one or all of the other. That's how you would solve that problem. It's not an op it's not a calculus problem to do the optimization. All right, great. So see you on. Two